Good morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Welcome to worship. Whether you're here in the sanctuary with us or if you're watching online, the members of First Presbyterian Church are glad that you're here and that you have come to worship the Lord our God. I have a few announcements to make before our service actually starts. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Roy Martin and Dr. Jim Rollins for filling in for me for the last two weeks so that I was able to go with John and our family to Phoenix to inter Miriam's uh, ashes. And I appreciate uh, the help with people filling in for me. I want to thank our worship leaders this morning. Jackie Hales, of course, is our music director and accompanist. And then singing for us are Jeannie Kaufman, Janet Wiley, Judy Oakley, and Phyllis Merritt. And Jim March, you're not singing with them, are you? Maybe. <laughs> Jim March is our liturgist this morning, and M.G. Moran has the headphones on in the back. So thank you to all of those <coughs> folks that make our uh, worship together rich. You probably noticed as you came in that mask, the mask restrictions have been eased somewhat. We recommend that you wear a mask, but it's not required and distancing is very much appreciated um, still in this time of uncertainty about what is going to happen next. We extend our Christian sympathy to the families of Debbie Lane, who is the daughter of Louise Myers. Debbie passed away uh, this week, and then also Lou Donovan, who was one of our winter visitors, and she was from Indiana, and she came every year. She was one of the first ones here and the last ones to leave. Uh, she absolutely loved it down here. And her daughter called me this week and told me that Lou had lost her battle with cancer. So we keep her family in our prayers. There's not a slide for this one, but th there is a session meeting after the service today. So I remind our elders to plan to stay. And that will take place after, we are so busy, after the group photo of those who finished the June Bible study of running the race. And if you have uh, tennis shoes stashed in your car or on your feet, um, please put those on and come out to the courtyard for a group picture for those who completed that Bible study. And here again, our busyness continues. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month. We will have communion, as always, and we encourage our uh, listeners to, that are at home to have some bread and some juice ready so that you can also participate with us. We remind you that, as always, we are in need of your giving, of your presence with us in financial areas because the work of the church does take your contributions to keep going. And we appreciate how generous and how faithful you've been in that giving. Speaking of giving, we are going to be collecting food for Sharing and Caring Food Bank next Sunday. Please bring non-perishable items and toiletries, and those will be dispersed to Sharing and Caring right here across uh, our parking lot. And last but not least, Next Sunday, does anybody know what next Sunday is? It's the 4th of July. It doesn't happen very often, but next Sunday is the 4th of July. So I encourage you to wear red, white, and or blue, um, any combination of those three, and let us show our patriotism and our thanks for living in such a wonderful country. Now, I think that takes care of our announcements. So let us quiet any other voices within us and let us go to God in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, come to us now as we gather to praise you and to hear your word proclaimed in word, in song, in prayer. Remind us of the great blessings of life that is lived in accordance with your will and your guidance. Bring us to the place where we cannot imagine our lives without you as the most important thing. 
Give us a faith that surpasses all human understanding and teach us to share that faith with others. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Good morning, and I'm so happy to be here today in front of you all uh, to uh, bestow the blessings of our Lord. Please join me in the call to worship from Psalms 30. Sing praises to the Lord, O you God's faithful ones, and give thanks to God's holy name. For the Lord's anger is but for a moment. The Lord's favor is for a lifetime. The Lord has turned our mourning into dancing. The Lord has taken off your sackcloth and clothed us with joy. So that our souls may pray to you, O Lord, and not, not be silent, O Lord, o Lord our, our God. God. We, we will give, give thanks, thanks to you forever. forever. Please stand as you are able in singing hymn 462. I love to tell the story. Please be seated. Because there is such great mercy with God, 
he is ready to forgive all. The ways we fail to live in faithfulness. Relying on that mercy, let us confess our sin before God and one another as we pray together the prayer of confession followed by a moment of personal meditation. Let us pray. Trusting, Trusting you, O oh Lord, does not always come easily when each day we are faced with the ugliness of the world. We act as if we do not believe that love conquers fear. We are not convinced that power comes through weakness. We cannot conceive how you could heal. Forgive our lack of faith, O oh God, and renew our trust in you. For we were disciples of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. These words from Psalm 130 provide assurance of the steadfast love and mercy of the Lord. Hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with the Lord there is great power to redeem. It is the Lord who will redeem us from all our sins. Thanks be to God. Amen. No children today. All righty. Let us pray for illumination. By the power of your spirit, speak your words to us, O God. Show us who you are and who you are calling us to be. For the sake of your Son and our Lord, Jesus Christ, amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 22 for 33. Listen for God's word. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are anew every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who, are, who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust, there may be yet be hope, to give one cheek to the smitter and be filled with insults, for the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you so much. <clears throat> Over the years, I have been drawn to the story I'm about to read to you. It's a story of a woman who seeks Jesus' healing. And for anyone who has experienced chronic pain or a medical condition that lasts for what seems to be forever, it is a story of determination, compassion, and hope. I first preached a sermon on this passage when I was preparing to become a commissioned lay pastor several years before I went to seminary. I feel called to revisit it from time to time to see how it still reflects my own story. And so now, let us listen to the word of the Lord as shared in the gospel according to Mark. As our hymn this morning says, I love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat what seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. From the fifth chapter of Mark. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. 
But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There are some things about our youth that define who we are at an early age. For me, the music of the 1960s was that factor. I especially liked the Motown sound because those tunes were so wonderful. They became ingrained in me and they can still transport me back to a more carefree time of high school football games and prom. Some of the songs are quite dated, but others are timeless taking on an important nuance depending on the situation. One of my favorites was the signature hit by the Four Tops, Reach Out. You may remember the way it goes. If you feel like you can't go on, like all your hope is gone, and you need a hand to hold, darling, reach out. I'll be there. The lyrics are quite comforting, even today, perhaps especially today, as we all look for something lasting that will always be there for us. We all begin life wanting and needing to be touched. New parents are told how important the act of touching is for newborn babies. Medical studies prove that infants who are held and cuddled and rocked are much more likely to thrive. We give our young children soft, cuddly toys and warm blankets to cuddle with as a source of comfort. We pat them on their backs or tenderly stroke their little foreheads as they fall asleep in our arms. And then, as children grow into toddlers, we begin the don't touch process. Don't touch that hot stove. Don't touch that expensive vase. Don't you dare touch your brother's toy again. Don't touch that dessert until you finished eating your broccoli. Now granted, some of our warnings are warranted for safety reasons. But we have also begun the process of setting up barriers, barriers which prevent us from reaching out, prevent us from taking the risk of connecting with each other or even with ourselves. On one hand, we appear to be a society obsessed with the idea of making connections. With a touch of a button, we can click our way through hundreds of TV channels, zap our frozen food with microwaves, and surf the World Wide Web. We have the option of any number of providers clamoring for our business to reach out and touch someone using our high-tech cell phones and our wonderful tablets. I'm sure I'm showing my age when I tell you that I think about being touched by angels on old TV programs or having certain sentimentally favorite stories or poems that touch my heart. We pride ourselves on being informed, aware, in touch with our world. Of course, we have to protect ourselves as well we have to watch our conversations because a friend might be touchy about certain subjects. 
And we all know that it is better to look, but don't touch. And then there are so many things that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. Last year, during the height of the pandemic, the ability to click or touch our way through life helped keep us connected. And now that the COVID restrictions are easing, I'm seeing that it's a hard habit to break. For many of us, there's no need to step outside or reach outside our own space at all. In the first five chapters of his gospel, Mark has described examples of Jesus' teaching ministry, a different kind of ministry because it was one in which Jesus himself walked among the common people, the people on the margins, and he dared to reach out beyond the barriers of religion and society to heal with the touch of his hand or the sound of his voice. And this passage that we just read comes as a rather rude interruption of another healing story, the request from Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, that Jesus would come and help to heal his sick daughter, which Jesus eventually did. Read the rest of the story. But this story within a story of this unnamed common woman quickly takes over the passage for me. It becomes a riveting focal point of the message that Mark is conveying. This woman has been suffering from a chronic disease for 12 years. And while the condition apparently is not acutely life-threatening, we can imagine how she must feel. She's been to doctor after doctor, and not only have the physicians been unable to help treat her disease successfully, but Mark tells us she is actually getting worse. She must be weak and anxious, frustrated, discouraged, just from the malady itself. But worse than that, she is an outcast. She is alone. If we assume that the woman is a Jew, then she is subject to the strict laws of purification that are set forth in the book of Leviticus. And these laws make a woman with such a condition to be unclean, untouchable. She would not be welcome in the temple or the synagogue. She would not be welcome in the marketplace on the street. She would not be welcome even in her own home. The law forbids anyone else in the family from having contact with this woman, lest they too become unclean, unfit in the eyes of the community and the religious establishment. This is a woman who is desperate. She has tried everything. There's no other answer for her, no one to help her. There's no family interceding to Jesus on her behalf. There are no friends willing to carry her into Jesus' presence for healing. She is one of those people that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. And yet, this woman finds her way through the large crowd of people who are surrounding Jesus as he walks through the streets. She struggles. She works her way through the throng of people, perhaps almost crawling at times, perhaps being dragged along by the flow of the people, perhaps being elbowed away by some of those who know that she is unworthy. But she continues toward Jesus with only one thought. If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. We're not told how the woman knows that this healing will happen. But whatever the reasons, they, 
are enough to compel her to seek him out. She does not even expect to talk to Jesus or to come into his presence and ask him to actually lay hands on her. She only hopes desperately that she can get close enough just to touch this Jesus. And suddenly there he is, right ahead of her among the crowd, almost within her reach. And she pushes on until she is just behind Jesus. And then she stretches out her hand and touches his cloak. And with that brief touch, that anonymous contact, the woman is immediately made well. She knows it. She feels it in the, dif in the difference in her body. It overwhelms her. And it scares her. And what of Jesus' reaction to this incident? It seems amazing, as the disciples said, look at the crowd around you. How can you ask who touched you? And yet Jesus knew that this was no ordinary touch. Power went forth from him. The woman felt it, and Jesus knew it too. And then in the closing verses of this passage, the connection is made clear. As the woman kneels before Jesus, his response to her is, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Daughter. Daughter. This person has been transformed from an outcast, forlorn, desperate, unnamed woman to a treasured member of the family. She comes into the presence of the Christ in fear and trembling over the miraculous healing of her physical disease, and she leaves with the promise of salvation. She defied the parameters of religious practice, of societal limits, social distancing, if you will, she defied the parameters of her physical problems to reach out and touch this holy man. Just touch him. And yet it was she who was touched. And in that one brief moment, a life was changed forever. Perhaps this is the message that we can take from Mark's gospel from Mark's story that we humans who have been created in God's image by God's own hand are creatures who need to reach out for ourselves and for others. Need to take a risk to step outside the walls with which we surround ourselves. Need to recognize that if we extend our hand we have the chance to touch that which will heal us, that which will renew us, that which will make us whole. God has been reaching out to humankind since the early days of creation. He's been close enough for us to receive his blessings as pictured in this scene from the Sistine Chapel which Michelangelo painted. God reached out and touched us with the ultimate <clears throat> expression of love and grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Look around. God is present with us here today in this place, in word, in scripture, in song, in spirit. God is with us in the events and people that surround us, those who we touch each day and those who touch us. When you feel like you can't go on, like all your hope is gone, 
and you need a hand to hold, my friends, reach out. Reach out. God is there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand as you are able and let us affirm our faith using the first question from the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil, that he protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, that everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. Please be seated. As we prepare for what my kids always call the long prayer, <laughs> you know, the prayer where the kids say, hurry up and say it and get it over with. <laughs> yeah. We don't feel that way as adults, do we? Because we know that God hears our words and that God knows who's on our prayer list. God knows who's in our hearts and our minds. So with hearts that are open and ready to speak to the Lord, let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, we come to you now making our petitions and requests. We try to approach your throne of grace with humility, but we are often more eager to make sure we don't forget anything we want you to do for us. Speak to us in the quiet places in our hearts so that we may hear your voice answering and may learn to obey. Lord, you touch us with your creative love as you form us from nothing to become your children, your people, acknowledging that we are in need of your continual presence. We pray that you would continue to form us into devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, who gave everything so that we might live eternally with you. Lord, you touched us through Jesus' perfect life that conquered sin once for all. Continue to teach us how to become more like Jesus in the things we say and do, in the way we treat others, in the way we exhibit his love to the world. Lord, you touch us by the presence of the Holy Spirit so that we dare to reach out to you for whatever reason we might have. Some of us are fighting sickness and disease. Some of us struggle with mental and psychological challenges. Some of us are fearful or sad or doubtful, or grieving. Lord, send us the signs of your healing power that comes in many forms. Lead us to see and recognize your grace working to make our lives productive and whole. Lord, you touch us with the bounty of blessings that you shower upon us. We are often slow to recognize your gifts so we pray for discernment as we place you first in our lives. May your church be forever faithful in our devotion and forever thankful for the opportunities you place before us. Keep our hearts pure, 
our minds dedicated, and our hands and feet carrying us into the world to share your goodness and salvation. Lord, you touch us even through the prayer Jesus taught disciples to pray in every time and place. And we pray those words together now, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as you are able to sing our closing hymn number 157, I Danced in the Morning. Thank you. 